Uh, if I might, I'll begin with a, uh, a short reflection that I found in the Magnificat for today's uh, Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. And it'll, it'll, in this kind of reflection, it'll be sort of an opening prayer for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus listened with an open ear and an open heart to the voice of his Father. Listening, he obeyed. Let us, who have been baptized in him, listen to the voice that calls us beloved children and gives us a work to do, the work of the gospel proclaimed and lived in love for God and neighbor. Dear Lord, we thank you for calling us in baptism to be your children. Help us then to listen to your voice and to do the work you give us to proclaim you as Lord and Savior point you out to everyone, and thereby to be involved in the very heart of the church, fostering her identity, which is to evangelize. And we pray this, Lord Jesus, through you, as you live and reign with the Father of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this past year of faith, was a marvelous opportunity for Catholics around the world to reflect on the great gift of our faith and on the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. However, Pope Francis knows well that the close of the year of faith is just a new beginning. Tonight, I would like to offer you, as evangelists, six specific challenges which stem from my recent pastoral letter, Go Forth with Hearts on Fire. These challenges share in common an intrinsic link to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It has been said that as Catholics, many of us are masters at living out Mark chapter 1, verse 44. Anyone recall it? <laughs> this must be a Catholic crowd. <laughs> well, in Mark chapter 1, 44, Jesus instructs the lepers, whom he has only just healed, go and tell no one anything. If we accomplish anything this evening, let it be that we cease to be the people of Mark, chapter 1, verse 44, and strive to be the people of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 19, in which Jesus says to his apostles and to us in this room, go and make disciples. Evangelization is not always easy for Catholics to talk about. We can easily become sidetracked by any number of other important concerns in the church and even forget that the work of the new evangelization will always be driven by a deep and intimate relationship between every one of us in Christ, a relationship lived out in the context of the church and celebrated in word and sacrament, the core of the sacred liturgy. Before sharing these challenges, permit me an aside about the recent and momentous first months of our Holy Father, Pope Francis's papacy. There's been a lot of controversy and misinterpretation about the things Pope Francis has said and done in recent months. Yet Pope Francis is drawing the interest of those who have paid little attention to the church 
or have been very critical of her. Her recent news article noted that over six and a half million people participated in various encounters with Pope Francis at the Vatican in 2013. General and private audiences, liturgical celebrations, Angelus addresses, and so on. A number of priests in our own diocese report observing what is being called the Francis effect, with increasing numbers of people returning to the sacrament of reconciliation. Some initial surveys suggest that there really is no Francis effect bringing people back to an active practice of the Catholic faith. But something is going on. People like this man and recognize in him the presence of God and the joy of the gospel message. No doubt, a portion of this is a very preliminary interest, like the crowds of outlookers that so often gather around Jesus at a safe distance to hear what he had to say. But that's enough. The Holy Spirit can do so much with the smallest crack in the door. Remember that some of those who gathered around Jesus ultimately stepped out of the anonymity of the crowd and talked with him. Miracles can result from this step, as the Gospels show. So whatever motivates the interest that people have in Pope Francis, the Holy Spirit is moving. And Pope Francis is taking full advantage of this opportunity to preach the gospel in ways that are often surprising, but always compelling and always centered on Christ. He is, of course, not changing church teachings, as some seem to fear, and it remains to be seen where those who are suddenly paying attention will ultimately come to a place of repentance and conversion, giving themselves over to Christ. Nevertheless, Pope Francis is touching hearts and challenging people inside the church and everywhere else to come to a new and deeper relationship with the person of Jesus Christ. And that really is what the new evangelization is all about. We might say that the success of the new evangelization, always the Holy Spirit's work, greatly depends on the willingness of each and every one of us to repent and to give ourselves over to God, who loves us more than we can possibly imagine. Pope Francis begins his new apostolic exhortation, Evangelium Gaudium, with these words, and I quote, The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness and loneliness. With Christ, joy is constantly born anew. End of quote. Do you recognize what he's talking about? Does his truth echo in your heart and mind in a personal, experiential way? Well, now let us go to the six challenges. First, a personal relationship. And so I turn to the first challenge being addressed to you as evangelists this evening. A personal relationship with Christ. In my pastoral letter, I spoke about a turning point in my own life. Something that happened to me several years ago on a silent eight-day retreat with a group of bishops. 
It was an experience of the Lord's presence and love to touch me in a way it never had before. Keep in mind that at this point, I had already been a bishop for many years. Permit me to expand a bit on this very significant moment in my life. I do so with some hesitation because I am not someone special or a holy person. I want to make absolutely clear that I am very ordinary and like you, in need of God's forgiveness and mercy. However, I share this moment because what I experienced was not something only for me or for a bishop, priest, deacon, or religious, but for every baptized person, for each one of you. Obviously, I knew that the Lord Jesus truly loves me, despite my limitations, weaknesses, and sinfulness. I accepted his love with gratitude and experienced that love in so many ways, as a disciple, then a priest, and finally a bishop. However, there was always what seemed to me to be like a glass wall, which seemed to prevent me from experiencing the Lord's love more deeply. That was my fault, not his. Somehow I was not open enough. And then during that eight-day all-silent directed retreat with a group of bishops, it's something I've been doing for over 25 years, that glass wall suddenly shattered. And I experienced being loved by the Lord Jesus in a way that is beyond words to describe adequately. The scripture given to me by the retreat director on which to reflect was from the book of the prophet Isaiah, and I quote, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Fear not, I am with you. Do not fear, I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I experienced the love of Jesus in a new and utterly different way. I was amazed. On several retreats since, the Lord has graciously enabled me to experience a similar confirmation of his love. Each time as I prayed over the scene at the Last Supper, where John the Apostle placed his head on the chest of Jesus, and surely heard the beating of Christ's heart. Such intimacy and love is reflected in that gesture, in that moment. As I said, this experience of being loved in such a new and different way, I can never deny nor forget. No, I still struggle, as we all do to respond faithfully to the Lord's word and to his will. I, too, go to confession on a regular basis, at least once a month, when I visit my spiritual director. But that experience was not meant for me alone, nor for bishops or priests or deacons or religious. No, it is meant for every baptized person, since at baptism we become, in fact, sons and daughters of God. Yes, adopted, but no less real, of God, whom we address in that most intimate way, Abba, that is, beloved Father. So the question arises, do you know our Lord? Whether we are a cradle Catholic, a convert, or someone who returned to the church after time in the wilderness, have we met him and experienced his love and mercy in a deep,
personal way. I'm not talking about an emotional response. And of course, this encounter won't look the same for everyone. But can you look at your life of faith and point to one or more moments when you experienced the Lord's closeness in a way that changed you? And is that change still happening in your life? If, as St. John the Cross suggested, silence is God's first language, are we fluent in that language? Do we take time to listen for the still, small voice of the Lord in our own hearts, in our very noisy and turbulent times? Second challenge, a personal relationship that is also ecclesial. The second challenge I invite you to reflect upon with me as evangelists is whether our personal relationship with Christ is also ecclesial. Me and Jesus is not a biblical way of looking at things. Like St. Thomas Aquinas, we are to bring the fruits of our contemplation to others, to live out our faith in the context of the church, that community of Christ's disciples. It's worth emphasizing that our relationship with the Lord is deepest when it is a profoundly ecclesial relationship. There is, in fact, no way to live a deeper and closer personal relationship with him than in the church and through the sacraments. That's why he gave us the church, to be the extension of his incarnation in every time and place. A truly evangelical Catholic faith never downplays or disregards the church. This is something that many people, even many Catholics, don't understand. So a key element of the new evangelization from a catechetical standpoint must be a renewed focus on the nature and doctrines of the church herself. Many people have various issues or objections to this or that teaching of the church. But when one really understands what, or rather who, the church is, these objections tend to fall away more easily. This isn't easy at a time when recent scandal and sin have fostered a great deal of distrust of the church and of religious institutions in general. I think Pope Francis is doing a great deal to temper that distrust and is allowing people to look at the church with new eyes. We need to join him in that and take advantage of this opportunity to help people better understand all he is saying and doing while they are paying attention as never before. I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring about a great deal of healing in the church. As I mentioned, Pope Francis is doing much to usher in what Blessed John Paul II prophetically called a new missionary age, a new springtime for the church. Third challenge, evangelizing amid ordinary circumstances. Third, I challenge you to deepen this relationship with the Lord Jesus within the church amid ordinary circumstances. This personal and ecclesial relationship is not something to be found apart from the ordinary circumstances of our daily life, but rather in the midst of them. This is often a very surprising thing even to faithful Christians. Father Jean-Pierre de Cossaud, the Jesuit author of the classic Abandonment to Divine Providence, stressed that God reveals himself through the daily events, concerns, 
possibilities, limitations, and sufferings of ordinary life. But that most of us wrongly believe these things are directing us away from him. How amazed we would be, he says, if we understood that what we consider worthless are the very things that bring us the presence of God when we are open to this. Father de Cassad taught us, as did many of the saints, that we find spiritual growth through recognizing and accepting God's will in every situation. One can find it, of course, only by knowing who God is. And that requires spending time with him. We spend time with those we love, getting to know them. And so, in his apostolic exhortation, Pope Francis invites, and I quote, all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them, end of quote. And the Pope asks us all, as he put it, to do this unfailingly each day. How are you doing that now? How might you do it more intently? purposefully. In my letter, I suggest some practical ways to do just that. The fourth challenge. The new evangelization ad intra. The fourth challenge I invite you to reflect upon is the call to lifelong learning. As Catholics, we need to be re-evangelized by continually returning to the basics and seeking to understand the riches of the faith more deeply. Where does the new evangelization take place? If your first response is in the parish or in contexts such as lectures offered by the Institute of Catholic Culture, you're right. If you consider that the re-evangelization of Catholics is a major thrust of this work. There's no question that this is of central importance. Adult Catholics, so many of whom we must acknowledge, received poor instruction or no instruction in the faith, need to rediscover the truths of the faith as adults. In many cases, the last formal instruction they had in the faith was leading up to their confirmation. So they approached their adult lives and adult concerns with the faith knowledge of an eighth grader. Professionals know that ongoing training, workshops, conferences, and the like are very important if one is to remain current in their field. And it should be no different with one's knowledge of the faith. We have continually to return to the basics and seek to understand the riches of the faith more deeply. There is always more to discover. And in our time, the abundance of good resources is impressive. Certainly, this institute plays a significant role in this good work in our diocese and beyond. And I am deeply grateful for that. We also point to the Catholic Distance University, an online, fully Catholic institution of higher learning begun 30 years ago by our founding bishop, Thomas J. Welsh. Through this online format of distance learning, you can grow in your understanding of our faith. You can do this for your own personal growth in the faith. And in addition, you can acquire a certificate in catechetics or a BA or MA degree in theology. For further information, I invite you to go to www.cdu.edu.
But I need not convince you of the importance of adult catechesis. You're here. I'm really preaching to the choir. <laughs> the fifth challenge, the new evangelization ad extra. As important as it is, the evangelization of church-going Catholics is not the end of the new evangelization. Thus, a fifth challenge for us here tonight is to pray and fast for those who have fallen away from the faith. According to the Pew Research Center, one-third of those who say they were raised Catholic no longer describe themselves as Catholic, which amounts to about 10% of the overall population in this country. If that doesn't break your heart, it should. These are people who don't come to Mass regularly or at all, wouldn't attend a lecture or other parish event, and may be entirely disinterested in speaking with the priest. They, have may, they may have been hurt by someone in the church. They may have left over some misunderstanding or an unfortunate encounter with the Catholic. Or they may have simply drifted away, as so many do. Perhaps the busyness of their lives pushed Mass out the door. Or perhaps they felt anonymous or confused by parish life. There are many possible reasons, but studies suggest that most people who stop practicing their faith don't do so because they no longer believe in God. Most still do believe in God, and we can build on that. For these people you are likely to be a key witness and evangelist. You may, in a very real way, be the church in their view. They may not trust the church at all and have no interest in hearing her out, but they will trust and listen to you because they know you. It doesn't mean you have to preach or quote scripture to them, but you can offer a sympathetic ear and the gift of your presence and time. Having the opportunity to speak with someone about the concerns of their lives and seeing in your life a peace and a joy that they would very much like to have may well lead them to give a second look at the faith they left aside. Maybe they recognize that you respond differently to stress that you don't join in the water-cooler gossip session, that you take time to go to Mass on your lunch break, that you quietly say a prayer before a meal, that you have a small holy image at your desk. Such small things can lead people to engage you in conversation about the very profound and personal things. God willing, you may end up in a role described by the Apostle James in his letter, as he puts it. My brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. There are many good and important reasons to take part in the work of the new evangelization. And this is a compelling one. It is a joyful thing to play even a small role in someone else's encounter with Christ. And I promise it will deepen your faith and draw you even closer to the Lord. The sixth challenge, the new evangelization rooted in the family. The sixth and final challenge I invite you to consider is this. The new evangelization is meant to begin in the context of the family. It all starts in our homes. We are familiar with the characterization of the Christian family as the domestic church. And that is a very real and very profound truth. 
Blessed John Paul went so far as to say, and I quote, the future of the world and of the church passes through the family. A point that Pope Benedict XVI echoed. Pope Francis also recognizes this fundamental truth, having called for an extraordinary synod on the family, which will take place in Rome this fall. The synod will undoubtedly be a new moment in the church's life. When the bishop delegates from all over the world, the synod fathers, we call them, and those others who will take part with the bishops, consultants, when they together reflect on the family. They will have received input from the entire people of God, gathered and synthesized through two different consultations one which we have just completed, another one later on, before the opening of the Synod. Pope Francis will be presiding over the sessions of the Synod. Our role will be prayer and penance, thereby supporting the deliberations, conclusions, and the final message. Parents are the primary educators of their children when it comes to passing on the faith. And their personal and joint witness to the faith's importance speaks far more loudly than any sermon or textbook can. In fact, earlier today in Rome, when Pope Francis baptized a number of small infants, that was exactly the point he made that we pass on the faith through baptizing them into that faith. And one day they will have grown up and they will baptize their children. He talked of it as a link, a chain, from one to the other. Openness to new life, keeping Sundays and feast days holy, praying the family rosary, helping children discern their vocation, and encouraging them to consider the priesthood or religious life as well as marriage, all of these are important ways to do the work of the new evangelization in the context of the family. These critical practices were never meant to be taken over by your pastor or Catholic school. Catholic couples should make sure to nourish their own faith as well. And this could be very challenging. Too many married Catholics see their vocation to marriage as something which somehow competes with their relationship with God as though it's a distraction. But in truth, those who are married are intended to find the Lord precisely through their relationships with each other and with any children God may give them, through all the daily challenges and joys that mark this beautiful vocation. Praise God and serve others according to your station in life, your vocation. Families are meant to help each other on the path to heaven, to walk that path together. And so they should approach devotion to God primarily as a family. Certainly this is greatly helped when spouses and children have time to spend in prayer with God individually but they must never lose sight of the fact that it is mainly as a family they should find their communion with the Lord. The family truly is the domestic church. To conclude, in Go Forth, I have tried to offer a very practical toolbox for each Catholic in our diocese to become a great evangelist here in Northern Virginia. A considerable number of Catholics have already begun a closer study of this letter in their parishes, workplaces, and families. The many graces of the year of faith have better prepared us to join our Holy Father in bringing the gospel joyfully to the whole world. We do that first and foremost in the mission territory of our own homes workplaces, 
and neighborhoods. My prayer is that each of you who come to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ in his church, in that community of his disciples, and in doing so, you will in turn find new ways to bring his love and mercy to those God has placed in your path. Evangelization is heart to heart. It unfolds within our personal relationships. Just imagine if every Catholic in our diocese invited one or at least one person to meet the Lord this year, such as the apostles did when they encountered Christ. They wanted others to meet him. Imagine what would happen. Dear brothers and sisters, may God bless you your families, and the work of this great institute in this new year and beyond. Pray for me as we go forth together with hearts on fire. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for a, uh, a very wonderful and gracious presentation. And um, if I could just take one point that I think is, uh, there's so many things to consider in Bishop Laverde's talk this evening, but I want, I'd like to hold on to one thing as you go home, and that is his point about lifelong learning, which I know is near and dear to our heart here at the Institute of Catholic Culture. But I want to offer a word of warning, and that is, that if we learn for the sake of learning, then we are not learning for the sake of Christ. And Bishop Laverde's very insightful letter focuses so beautifully, and his words tonight, on the most fundamental point, and that is that we must have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And only when we have that relationship, only when our hearts are on fire with Him. Will our evangelical work be effective? What you learn at the Institute of Catholic Culture must be brought to others. And he left us with that beautiful vision, what if? And I will tell you this, that the church is calling us to a new evangelization not because there is a problem. Certainly, we've got some problems on our hands. But she is calling us to a new evangelization because she is calling us back to who we are as Christians. Christ it is who gave himself to us. And we are made in his image and likeness. And if you say to me, Deacon Sabatino, yeah, evangelization, nice for you and the bishop. We are called, each one of us, not me alone, not the bishop, not the priests each one of us, to engage our society. And society not as an idea. Society as real people that God puts us in their lives on a daily basis. When you walk into the store, when you walk into your homes, when you walk into your workplace, you are there for one reason and one reason only, and that is to bring Jesus Christ to the world who needs Him for salvation. And when we fail to do that, my friends then we fail to be followers of Jesus Christ. I dare say we fail to be Christians. If you say, Deacon Sabatino, how do I do it? Do it! Because God will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will make it happen. When you open your arms, you open your mouth, you put your hands and feet at His service. Then the beautiful words with the, which the bishop has written and spoken here this evening will come flowing out of your mouth. And I will tell you, and I know you laugh at me when I say this, but I get very nervous speaking in front of groups of people. <laughs> I do. But I will tell you that the Lord gives each one of us a gift when we need it. And He will give you that gift. The Institute of Catholic Culture is here as a small part of the work of the new evangelization. And we will succeed in our work when you leave this room and take what you receive here out into the world which is in need. If we find our society is darkening, there is a dimming. The flame of, of the Holy Spirit seems to be 
vanishing from our society. We need to look no further than ourselves because we have been given the gift to be his hands and feet in our society. Okay. Your Excellency, would you give us a blessing, please? Yes. I was hoping that we might end that way. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for coming out on this evening. It's not bad in terms of weather, but you all have other commitments and other responsibilities tomorrow, so I'm very, very grateful. May the Lord bless you and deepen his presence in your lives. He give you, beyond knowledge, wisdom and insight to know him, to love him, to serve him. May he give you fortitude and strength to witness to him. May he enfold you in his heart, and then with the love flowing from that heart, may you go forth to bring his love to everyone. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.